From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. I'm Kaylee Lines. President Biden meets congressional leaders at the White House working to make a deal on supplemental funding. House Speaker Mike Johnson emerging just moments ago, saying the border must be a top priority and the status quo on Ukraine funding is unacceptable. We'll get the view from inside the GOP conference. Congressman Jason Smith, chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, will join us as he pitches his colleagues on a new $78 billion tax deal. Plus, the fight for New Hampshire. A new poll from the Granite State shows Nikki Haley 16 points points behind Donald Trump as she tries to rebuild momentum ahead of the first primary. All of that is still ahead. We begin, though, this evening with news just out of the White House. House Speaker Mike Johnson just meeting with the president, other major congressional leaders, and had this to say when he walked outside. We had a uh, productive meeting, I think, House and Senate leaders. Uh, the president was very forthright. I told the president what I have been saying for many months, and that is that we must have change at the border. Joining me now for more are Bloomberg's Julie Fine in Texas and Gregory Cordy here with me in Washington. So, Julie, just to begin with you, because I know you see this border issue up close and personal every single day in Texas. Mike Johnson says he has to insist the U.S.-Mexico border be a top priority, even as Chuck Schumer, others suggest that this is going to be a bipartisan agreement. They want to get a deal done. How hard is it going to be? It's hard to get something done on the border. You've seen it for years. You've seen Congress not be able to pass something. It's hard to get something done. However, let's go back to Iowa, where you and I were just a few days ago. Polls there showed that the immigration was among the top priorities. In some polls, it was the top priority. So therefore, this is one lawmakers know in terms of an election year and in terms of keeping the government funded. They have to get something done. The question is, how far will they go? What will they need for some type of an agreement that this can get passed? Kaylee? Well, Julie, I'm glad you bring up Iowa because Gregory Cordy was there with us as well. And Julie's absolutely right that when those caucus goers went to decide who they wanted to be the Republican nominee, they had border issues at the top of their mind, not just on the economy, as was the prevailing thought uh, beforehand. So doesn't that suggest that President Biden needs this just as badly as anyone else, that maybe he would be willing to make a deal here that he wouldn't have otherwise? I would think so. And you're right. It was surprising to us to see those numbers from the Associated Press vote cast poll for in 10 Iowans going to caucus and the Republican Party thought uh, immigration was the number one issue. And that's surprising because every other poll, including our own Bloomberg Morning Consult poll of swing state voters, shows it's far and away economy and in yeah. inflation, those kinds of issues. So this is going to be a wake-up call for the White House. The question now is how badly do Republicans want to deal? Because this, if they see that this is an issue that's going to help them in the November presidential election, there might be less incentive to get a deal done and, and help to defuse that bomb for Biden in, in November if they think it's going to be Biden who's going to be blamed for the situation at the border. Well, and that's an excellent point. And I've asked this question to many people, Julie, this idea that will this Republican-controlled House of Representatives including leadership like Speaker Johnson, who have a very close relationship with former President Trump, who is assumed to be the general election uh, candidate against President Biden. Are they going to allow President Biden to have what he could call a win on border security? Well, I think I'm not sure they want President Biden to have a win on this. But on the flip side, if you keep saying no to deals in the Republican Party, deals that you say are so important to you, you have a problem too. So here's what they have to decide. What's more important, giving President Biden a loss on immigration or keeping the government funded? Because that will not bode well for anyone if the government shuts down. Well, of course, the other side of this border security negotiation is that it is an exchange, Gregory, for Ukraine funding. That is, is the deal here. So when we consider how... In an election year, legislators and the president are thinking about this issues. On the one hand, the president really does want to prioritize that foreign policy, and yet it doesn't seem like it's the foreign policy efforts, be it Ukraine, Israel, or others, that are actually the ones that will resonate at the ballot box. 
Yeah, absolutely. And of course, President Biden was in Congress for decades yeah. and knows how a deal gets done. And so he's tried to package this Ukraine uh, funding deal with a, some kind of a border deal. We just saw Speaker Johnson come out of that meeting at the White House. But there was a little bit of cross messaging between the White House and congressional leaders, as congressional Republicans. Uh, the White House seemed to think this was a meeting about Ukraine. To Speaker Johnson, it was a meeting about border, border, border. So it would be interesting to be a fly on the wall in that meeting to see how much of each topic got discussed because each one obviously has their priorities. They're going to have to bring them together eventually if a deal's going to come together. Eventually. I guess we're all waiting on the timeline, especially considering we could be facing a partial government shutdown if a continuing resolution plan doesn't actually pass in the next several days. When we think about the 2024 election, though, obviously all of these issues will color that outcome, but we are still in a primary fight, technically. Joe, Donald Trump is not the Republican nominee yet, and New Hampshire is just around the corner. After his decisive win in Iowa, we have new polling out, Gregory, from Suffolk University today, together with uh, some local outlets, NBC10, Boston, Boston Globe, etc., that show Trump at 50 percent and Nikki Haley 16 points behind him at 34 in the Granite State. Is this really as close a contest as Nikki Haley has been trying to paint that picture of? Well, a couple of things. First of all, look at the trend line, and you'll see that uh, Nikki Haley, since September, has been shooting up in New Hampshire. Uh, that, that trend line isn't moving up quite fast enough to catch Trump at this point. If, if the New Hampshire primary were held maybe next month, uh, maybe she would. But also, the, the New Hampshire voters haven't really had the chance to completely digest the Iowa results. What uh, New Hampshire voters tend to do is look at those three tickets out of Iowa that, that uh, we talk about. <laughs> That's Trump, Haley, and DeSantis. And they'll say, OK, Iowa, thank you very much for those three tickets. We'll take it from here. They're going to make their own decision. Uh, and so let's wait a couple of days to see how the polls are. The average in the Real Clear Politics average is 13, so it's a little bit closer. The magic number for Haley is to, she doesn't have to win New Hampshire, but she really does have to bring it within the low single digits to really make a statement that she's a contender here. Of course, Julie, the man who got the number two ticket out of Iowa was Ron DeSantis. And on that very same poll, he's down at 5 percent, low single digits. And Bloomberg is reporting today that he essentially is casting New Hampshire aside. He's focusing his staff, his efforts on South Carolina, Nikki Haley's home state, where she still is far behind President Trump in the polls. So is that the only viable path for the DeSantis campaign to move forward? It's South Carolina or maybe bust? Well, I think for the DeSantis campaign, I mean, if you look at the numbers, he's not going to come in second in New Hampshire unless something happens that none of us are expecting. So if he goes to South Carolina, again, Nikki Haley's home state, where she's coming in right now, polling, coming in second, he makes a dent there. That's really not good news for her. So I would imagine that that's why he made that type of decision. And also knowing that you're not going to win New Hampshire. The headlines aren't going to be good for you there anyway. Why not focus elsewhere? Well, it's also a question of resources, Julie. You brought us a discussion in Iowa with Roy Bailey, who's the co-chair of DeSantis Campaign's finances. He was saying, look, we're going through Super Tuesday. Yet simultaneously, Bloomberg's also reporting today that the primary super PAC backing DeSantis never back down is laying people off. That can't necessarily be a good sign. That's never a good sign when you see that. And you've also seen Never Back Down make a lot of changes throughout this campaign. So therefore, if you're looking at some financial problems, you're looking at a big loss possibly coming in New Hampshire, why not try something else if you do have limited resources to work with? Well, and of course, for Ron DeSantis, he had said previously, Gregory, that he was going to do some events in New Hampshire this week, one of them being a debate with Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley said... I will debate Trump or I will debate no one, essentially. She's backed out. That debate is canceled. What do you make of that decision, considering she, along with Ron DeSantis and others, have been calling out Trump for not debating? It was a little surprising just because Nikki Haley seems to have done very well in the debate so far this cycle. Every time she debated, you saw that trend line going up in, in her polling. Uh, but usually if you are, think you're, you're winning and think things are going well, you're, you don't have as much of uh, an incentive to debate. There's only risk and not reward. And of course, if you're behind, you won as many debates as possible because that's a chance to make up ground. Well, right. And she does have ground to make up if if the polling we're seeing today, at least, is is suggesting that if she can't do it in New Hampshire, I know you said she doesn't necessarily have to win. But if we're being realistic, if she doesn't win in New Hampshire, what stands in the way of Donald Trump being the nominee for the well, Republican Party? 
Well, one of the problems that both Haley and DeSantis has is not just that Trump is beating them both, but that they're so close together. Yeah. There really wasn't a breakaway second place finisher in Iowa. Uh, they were separated only by two percentage points. And one of them has got to really emerge very quickly now as the alternative to Trump, because if we continue to split, see a split in the anti-Trump vote, the non-Trump vote in the Republican primaries, then we'll just have a replay of 2016 where uh, President Trump was able to divide and conquer the rest of the Republican field uh, all the way to the Republican nomination. Well, it continues to get thinner. Asa Hutchinson, Vivek Ramaswamy dropping out after Iowa. I guess we'll see if we really get down to two candidates eventually. Gregory Cordy and Bloomberg's Julie Fine, thank you both so much for joining me this evening. Now coming up, we'll turn more towards geopolitics, the war in Ukraine, and President Vladimir Zelensky's trip to Davos. I'll be joined by Melinda Herring of the Atlantic Council next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky met with titans of Wall Street at the World Economic Forum in Davos this week. Jamie Dimon, Ray Dalio, and BlackRock's Stephen Schwartzman among the business leaders in attendance. Joining us now is Melinda Herring, Atlantic Council Eurasia Senior uh, Center Senior Fellow. Melinda, as Zelensky is making his pitch at Davos to business leaders, it, it comes against a backdrop of here in the U.S., a meeting that just wrapped up at the White House over supplemental funding requests for Ukraine, tying it with border security. And House Speaker Mike Johnson was pretty clear his top priority is the border. He says the status quo on Ukraine funding is unacceptable. How confident are you that this Ukraine funding and a deal can be made between the White House and this Congress? Kylie, you want me to play false prophet? I, I will try. So honestly, no one knows. Back in December, back in, in Thanksgiving time, I was much more confident that this bill was going to pass. The longer it goes on, the less likely it is to pass. The Republicans are unified, and even the most ardent of the Republicans, someone like Senator, uh, someone like Senator Romney, has said we got to get the border first. So it's a very, very difficult negotiation. Speaker Johnson has has really pushed very hard as well. Uh, so. I, I'm not confident it's going to pass, but there are some other maneuvers that can be done to bring that bill to the floor. But right now, it's still it seems like it's still stuck and Ukraine needs this this money urgently. The war is not going anywhere. Well, it's interesting to hear you say this, Melinda, as you've previously told me, it's not a question of if there's more Ukraine funding, but when maybe now it is more of an if. But as we consider the when, how much time realistically is left on the clock for Ukraine? So Ukraine needs this money as soon as possible uh, in order to prosecute the war. We, the, this, this delay is already having an effect on, on the front lines. We know that Ukrainian soldiers are already starting to uh, keep track of how many shells that they're sending. Um, and it, it's people are complaining also about American resolve. You hear this it, it, all over Ukraine from the front lines uh, to the capital as well. So uh, it, it's, it's definitely having an effect already. If you ask me to analyze, do we have the votes to pass the bill? Yes, there are still enough votes to pass the bill, but leadership has to be behind it. And the closer we get to the presidential election, the less likely it is to pass. But there is some good news, if you don't mind me putting a little good news in there. Europe is starting to step up. Chancellor German Chancellor Schultz has said he's called a big meeting February 1, and he is mad, and he's telling France, Italy, and Spain, it's time to pay up, baby. So I see the EU getting together, uh, and he, he's telling these three countries in particular they haven't done enough on weapons. Is it going to be enough? I'm not willing to say that, but it is good news that Europe is wake, waking up to this new reality. And it's interesting because when you listen to Republican presidential candidates like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, he, the point he makes on Ukraine funding is that Europe should be uh, picking up more of that burden. While Nikki Haley has said she supports continuing aid to Ukraine, she doesn't want to give them cash, though. She wants to give them weapons. What is it that Ukraine actually needs? Does it need weapons or does it need cash? Does it need both? It needs both. But right now, it, it needs weapons in particular. The United States government is the number one donor on weapons. 
Uh, we have a lot of the things that they need, and we need to get this assistance to them as soon as possible. The EU has been great on uh, on money. They're the ones that are keeping the budget afloat. But the, the EU assistance is also caught up right now in politics. Hungary has been holding that. That's $50 billion. And Ukraine needs that money to keep its, its budget uh, afloat. The good news is, though, that the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has said that we are going to pass that with or without Hungary. So that's a story that I'm watching as well. Of course, as we watch this unfold, we get closer and closer, Melinda, to the two-year anniversary of this war beginning, and yet it still seems that it's just a stalemate between Ukraine and Russia. As time goes on, is there any real chance of either side becoming more likely to win, or does it just mean that Ukraine's odds of winning are deteriorating? So I, I'm not sure it's a stalemate yet. It is still a hot war, and many people are still dying on each side. Uh, the front isn't moving a whole lot. I think that that's a fair characterization. Uh, it will be the second anniversary, February 24th. What does that mean? It means that the world will inevitably lose interest. We saw interest decline with Israel-Gaza. Uh, it means that this year is going to be a little bit different. There were high, high expectations last year in 23 that Ukraine was going to retake more of its territory. Ukraine's already retaken 50%, though, of the territory that Russia had occupied. So that's a big number. It did not make the progress that many expected it and hoped and prayed that it would last year with the counteroffensive. This year, though, I, I, I'd say let's be realistic. The best way to characterize 24 it, it, with the war it, between Ukraine and Russia is it's a race to resupply. So what you need to be watching are drones, rockets, and personnel. These are the, the, the things that both sides are trying to increase their stock of and that they're, they're going to have another go at it. I don't see any room for negotiations in the coming year. There's not any appetite on either side. Well, so if Ukraine were to get those drones, rockets, and personnel, do you think realistically Ukraine would be able to reclaim that remaining 50 percent of their territory, get it to 100 percent? Is that even possible with all of the assistance in the world? Kylie, when you talk to military experts like Lieutenant General Ben Hodges or General Philip Breedlove, those are my two go-to guys, they say it is eminently possible for Ukraine to win if we give them the assistance they need. We have not given them the assistance they need. 20 attackums is not enough to do what Ukraine needs. They need F-16s. They need a sufficient supply of attackums. The White House also needs to remove its silly prohibition on Western weapons. So right now, we do not allow Ukraine to use Western weapons to hit Russia proper. It doesn't make any sense. Russia is buying, we know that they're buying weapons from North Korea and Iran. That's a third party country. So why can't Ukraine use the weapons the West gives and hit Russia? We need to, to remove that prohibition. Otherwise, Ukraine is a sitting duck. All right. And on that note, we will leave it. Melinda Herring, Atlantic Council, Eurasia Center, Senior Fellow, thank you so much for joining thank me. Thank you. Now coming up, we'll turn back to the U.S. economy as signs of strength for the U.S. consumer show up in retail sales data. It topped analyst estimates for the month of December. We'll have the details and what it means for the Fed next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I think that the Federal Reserve, if anything, is going to err on the side of holding interest rates. If you look at labor markets, if you look at the underlying economy itself, it's quite strong. And I think that uh, the danger of undershooting is far greater than the danger of overshooting. Uh, in other words, I don't think the Fed would like to see a resurgence of inflation. That was State Street CEO Ron O'Hanley speaking with Bloomberg at the World Economic Forum in Davos. This as U.S. retail sales rise at the strongest pace in three months in December, capping a solid holiday season that suggests consumer resilience heading into the new year. Joining us now to discuss is Stuart Paul of Bloomberg Economics. Stuart, it seems like we continue to get data point after data point that suggests more resilience on the part of the consumer than we thought they would show. How much longer can that strength continue? You know, we have seen some upsides of prices. We did see 0.6% retail sales growth in December. We saw 0.8% uh, for the control group, which is a more distilled down version that 
provide some indication that fourth quarter GDP growth is going to be somewhere in the order of 2%. Again, pretty impressive. But if you look at uh, credit card data, if you look at consumer defaults on loans, including auto loans, they are on the rise. So it does look as though consumers are starting to feel some of the weight of relatively restrictive monetary policy coming through. Uh, yeah. So there's a, a point at which they're going to need to start tightening their belt, and we think it's coming soon. Well, on that restrictive monetary policy, Fed swaps have now reduced the odds of a March rate cut to about 50-50. What do you think the odds are, especially in light of data like today's? We think that a March rate cut is still very much so in play, but there is still a lot of data that we end up needing to that we end up uh, really needing to see before that. We're going to get a couple jobs reports. We're going to get a couple inflation reports. We're going to get core PCE inflation uh, for December reported next week that's going to be on the order of about 0.15% month over month, and that's going to bring the three-month moving average on an annualized basis uh, just about to the Fed's 2% target. And when that's the case, if you have inflation, core inflation within striking distance of the Fed's target, there is a reason for the Fed to be optimistic that it could achieve a soft landing, and so it might start taking its foot off the brakes in the hope that it can achieve that soft landing relatively soon. You know, uh, Ron O'Hanley he made a pretty good point that with hot retail sales data like we just saw, of course, the odds of a rate cut in March are going to decline. But in the hopes of yeah. achieving that soft landing, that cut is still in play. Stuart, I just have one minute left with you, but I'm about to have a conversation with the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, who has just struck a deal to that would, in part, expand the child tax credit. What impact would that have on the U.S. economy should it pass? Of course, supportive for growth. Of course, uh, supportive for consumer spending. I think that the bigger issue here is whether or not a full shutdown can be avoided. And in the event that a child tax credit helps to facilitate the avoidance of a shutdown uh, and a deal getting signed, uh, that's supportive of Q1 2024 growth. Uh, in the absence of any sort of a deal, 20 basis points of growth gets shaved off uh, during the quarter in which a shutdown occurs. Uh, so that's really the biggest issue is avoiding sort of self-inflicted wounds. All right. Stuart Paul of Bloomberg Economics, thank you so much. Congress is trying to avert that shutdown by passing yet another continuing resolution. Two parts, laddered again, March 1st and March 4th, or March 8th, rather. We'll see how much progress can be made on that in the next several days. But coming up, we'll get more on that looming shutdown and that tax deal I was referring to. Republican Congressman Jason Smith of Missouri, the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, will join me to discuss the deal, perhaps calls to change it, and more. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. These folks who I didn't think would come up with a deal necessarily um, were able to come up with a tax deal that is pretty much offset or paid for. Nonetheless, there's still some gimmicks. One of them is that these are only temporary tax extensions, both on the business side and the child tax credit side. Mm -hmm. They're sensible policies. They make sense that they're brought together, but they're going to expire in 2025. And if you actually well, you estimate the overall costs, making this permanent or in a 10 year window, you're looking at upwards of half a trillion dollars. So there is a big price tag here. Maya McGinnis of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget speaking with me earlier on Sound On. This as Senate Finance Committee Chair Ron Wyden and House Ways and Means Chair Jason Smith announce a bipartisan tax deal that includes roughly $80 billion in breaks for research and development, business interest and equipment depreciation, and changes to the child tax credit that benefit the working poor. I'm pleased to say Congressman Jason Smith, one of the architects of this deal, as I mentioned, is joining me now. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for being with me on what is the 17th of January. Tax season starts on the 29th. Can you get this passed before then? You know, we're going we're gonna to do everything we can. Um, I hope over the next couple weeks that we can get this on the president's desk. Um, however, you know, I, I won't put a timeline that it has to pass by the 29th or the 30th, whatever it is. But um, there's definitely a, a huge uh, movement of support uh, since we announced this agreement yesterday. 
Does that support include that of House Speaker Mike Johnson? What has he told you about this deal? You know, we've had a, the great thing about Speaker Johnson is that he's empowered his committee chairman to do the work, and that's exactly what we did. We went and over the last couple months been working with the, the Senate finance chairman to come up with what we think is a very reasonable agreement um, that, that helps American families, it helps the American worker, and it's, it's equally divided between um, individual and also business aspects. But the speaker has not yet formally endorsed this plan. Is that is that the correct understanding? No, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. But I'm not going to speak for the speaker because uh, I'm only speaking for myself. But we will have this bill marked up um, on Friday from the Ways and Means Committee. And hopefully it will be on the floor in no time at all. Should we expect any changes at that markup and what might they be? Um, th we have the agreement. Of course, once you came out with the agreement, you have every individual that's asking for their tax provision <laughs> to be included. And that's exactly what would cause the bill to die. And the whole basis is these are important provisions that have expired and we need to, we need to extend them because it's affecting a lot of small businesses and workers. And, and that's why we felt like this would a, was a good compromise that would, w would allow us to be able to get something passed in this divided Congress. Well, and I know, as you say, everyone has things maybe that they would like to change. There have been some pretty vocal calls, though, from members of your own party reg regarding the state and local tax de deduction, the SALT cap, maybe have that raised. Is that something you're likely to agree to? Like I said, we have our agreement, and the agreement is, is what's before us. If we continue to allow additional changes like that, like the state and local tax, it will sink the bill. And we want to pass this bill for the American people, the American family, and that is the focus. This bill will affect and help all Americans. It's not just going to help um, Americans in certain um, niche issues. Okay, so perhaps the salt cap to be dealt with separately then. It, it, I, we played a little bit of my conversation with Maya McGinnis at the—I'm sorry, would you like to— yeah, what, what I will say is, is if we're able to pass this bill and make it into law, that will prove, uh, that will show a proven track record of a bipartisan tax package. There hasn't been a bipartisan tax package in years. This would break that barrier, and then we can do additional tax measures because there's there's a lot of tax items that's out there. I hear more and more about them from uh, members uh, by the minute. Well, obviously, you're right about how difficult it is to come to these kind of agreements on tax policy. That, though, being on the revenue side, and it strikes me as interesting, and Maya McGinnis uh, said this to me in my conversation with her uh, earlier today as well, that there is efforts to be made on the revenue end of the equation when you still haven't even sorted out spending in Congress yet for the fiscal year we've been in for months now. Is this being done out of order? You know, it's being done with our responsibility. As chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, my responsibility is tax, trade, health care, social security, not appropriations. That's the Appropriations Committee. And so yeah. we can walk and chew gum. That's, in fact, what we did. And if you look at the tax package that we have proposed, it's not going to lose any revenues. In fact, it's paid for because we're eliminating bad tax policy, which is a, a prior uh, COVID um, um, item that has showed lots of fraud that Republicans and Democrats both agreed that needs to stop, which will pay for this, this entire package. I understand that you chair ways and means. You aren't necessarily dealing directly with the budget, but you will theoretically have to cast a vote in the coming days on this continuing resolution, proposed stopgap ladder, laddered measure to extend funding between March 1st or March 8th, depending on what program we are talking about. This would be CR number three, if I have my count right. Are you confident that this will be the last? Yeah, I, I'm not confident. Um whether it will be the last. Um, you know, we're waiting for the Senate to send it over to the House, from my understanding. But I, um, 
I don't have any doubt that we will continue with the CR to keep government open and funded until there's a resolution on the funding agreements. I know that the speaker and um, the majority leader over in the Senate was at the White House today to discuss um, trying to get to an agreement. They're still working on that, and that will, that will be the result of how many CRs are necessary. Well, and I'm glad you brought up that meeting with our final moment with you, Mr. Chairman. Speaker Johnson, when he emerged from that meeting at the White House, said the U.S. border has to be the number one, the top priority, that the status quo on Ukraine funding essentially can no longer stand. What do you need to see in a deal for it to get your vote? Are you on the camp of it's H.R. 2 or nothing else? Let me tell you, we have to secure the southern border. The president, by the stroke of the pen, could re-implement some policies that he eliminated, such as remain in Mexico. Remain in Mexico alone would help with the problem by roughly 70 percent. These are policies that need to be moved forward. They worked. They were helpful. They benefited the nation. The number one issue when I'm talking to folks back home is the un the poorest border the border looks like swiss cheese we have to do something about it we need to make sure we know who's coming into our country and we also need to stop the fentanyl that's coming into our country all right mr chairman we'll leave it on that note thank you so much for joining me and please come back to bloomberg as you continue to work in the coming weeks to get this tax deal through that is congressman jason smith of missouri the chair of the house ways and means committee Coming up, we'll turn toward 2024. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley face an uphill battle in New Hampshire after Trump's decisive victory in Iowa. We'll be joined by our political panel on what to expect next Tuesday. Next, this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. She's got to win New Hampshire in order to really become a player to win the nomination. If you look at these numbers where she's trailing, she needs a bit of a game changer. Without a debate or some focusing event, it's hard to imagine what's going to you know, change the momentum. If she had come out of Iowa in second place, I think that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But without that second place win, where does that momentum, where does, you know, start pushing her in the, you know, in the back as opposed to blowing in her face at this time? That was Spencer Kimball, Emerson College polling director on the outlook for Nikki Haley as she prepares for the New Hampshire primary on Tuesday. Joining us now is our political panel, Kristen Hahn of Rock Solutions and Maura Gillespie, founder of Bluestack Strategies. Maura, you're in New York this evening, but as we look even further north to New Hampshire, the new Suffolk University poll out today really got a lot of our attention because Trump's at 50, Nikki Haley's at 34. That's a 16-point gap. Is she really competitive in the Granite State? So I saw that poll as well, but I've also seen others that have them tied. So, you know, really what comes down to it is who shows up on Tuesday and what the, you know, what the mood is for, for an appetite for another 2020 rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, or are they looking for new leadership? You know, we've talked about polls that came out, you know, even a few months ago where more than half of New Hampshire caucus or primary voters said they would choose anyone but Trump. So it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see who shows up for Nikki Haley on Tuesday uh, and, and, you know, where she lands at the end of this primary. Uh, I'm hopeful that she comes out on top, but it's going to be close. Well, Democrats and independents, Kristen, could theoretically show up on Tuesday because of the rules of the primary in New Hampshire. How reliant is she on those crossover voters? And do you think they actually will, in fact, cross over? I think some of them probably will. So I think she's overly reliant on them and actually just looking past New Hampshire to South Carolina. I mean, Trump is the favorite in her home state, you know. So I think we have to look a little bit beyond, um, you know, New Hampshire into Super Tuesday and some of the, these other contests because, you know, I think she's got to expand uh, her reach with these voters and her own party if she has any hope of, of coming out on top. Well, Maura, she brings up South Carolina, and Bloomberg is reporting today that Ron DeSantis is shifting the majority of his staff to South Carolina. The day after the Iowa caucus, he was in South Carolina. Is that his last remaining hope? if he wants the nomination? I think so. It's also a benefit, a net benefit for Nikki Haley for Ron DeSantis to stay in because it does splice up a little bit more of the Trump vote. 
And so to that effort, yes, yeah, uh, you know, Ron DeSantis is, is putting whatever egg is he has left uh, towards South Carolina. But I, I do think that it's starting to look pretty, for those of us who are not lucky to have a Donald Trump as our candidate, it's starting to look a little bleak because of the fact that, um, again, you know, he's got more and more people coming out in the GOP endorsing him, despite what they know. Uh, for, for a lot of them, they know better, but they're putting their, their support behind him. They're endorsing him. You saw Ted Cruz last night uh, endorse Donald Trump. So unfortunately, it seems as though more people are going to just acquiesce and pretend like this is all OK and give in to Donald Trump as our candidate. Well, you know who else endorsed Donald Trump actually on the day? of the Iowa caucus, Vivek Ramaswamy, after he got forth and dropped out. And I noticed a post on X today, this afternoon. He says, quote, I'll give Ron DeSantis immense credit if he does the right thing and drops out before the New Hampshire primary. Most of his votes will go to Trump, and we can end this primary to make sure that Nikki and her neocon ilk never come anywhere near the White House. That's a key reason why I exited. <laughs> Kristen, is he right? Maybe not necessarily about DeSantis dropping out, but that if DeSantis did, Nikki Haley essentially wouldn't stand a chance in New Hampshire. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I'm sure that I don't think we actually know. Like, these voters are very interesting. It's so hard to know what they're going to do in New Hampshire. So, you know, I think Ron DeSantis, you know, ditching out, yes, to those voters probably go to Donald Trump, probably. Um, but, you know, I don't think that he's going to. So it might be a little bit of a moot point. Well, Vivek's voters, at the very least, may well go to Trump. At least that seems to be the prevailing, prevailing thinking, while Chris Christie's votes perhaps go to Nikki Haley. Mora, just to come back to you on DeSantis specifically, separately to the South Carolina news, Bloomberg reported today that Never Back Down, which is, of course is the major super PAC primarily that is backing him, is laying people off. Is he going to have the resources to get this thing to South Carolina, let alone Super Tuesday? No, and I think that's been one of the big talking points surrounding his campaign is that they are running out of money. So that plays a big factor. And when you need a robust, again, I, I campaigned out in New Hampshire for Jeb Bush years ago. And, you know, you got to get out there. And there are some parts of the state that, you know, you really got to have a, a motivated crew and a motivated campaign staff who is willing to go out there and elements and, and door knock and make phone calls. And so I can, I can see that he's not able to do that uh, the way he probably had hoped at this point. Um, but just one more point about Vivek uh, Ramaswamy. I think it's interesting that he would make that tweet and that comment considering the fact that despite having done over or nearly 400 events in Iowa, he could have as well dropped out before Iowa, the caucus took place, if he really wanted to support Trump. So I think it's hysterical to me to watch him go and tout such things uh, when he chose not to do that uh, when he had the position to do so. Yeah, he bragged about what he mm -hmm. called a double Grassley, all 99 mm -hmm. counties twice. But I want to talk about someone from a different state, not Iowa, but Georgia, because Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, spoke to Bloomberg in Davos earlier today about this race and what the messaging should be around it. Just take a listen to what he said. We need to be forward thinking. We need to tell people, you know, what we stand for, what we're going to do. We don't need to be looking in the rearview mirror and relitigating the 2020 election and really you know, lay out for the American people what it is we're going to do to, for them to help fight through, you know, 40 year high Joe Biden inflation, disaster at the border, the weakness that we're seeing in the world and a lot of other things. And that's what I've been urging the candidates to do. And that would go for former President Trump as well. More are any of those candidates, President Trump included, actually doing that right now? Nikki Haley is. Nikki Haley is explaining to voters, I think, every day why she's running for for the president, why she wants this nominee, nomination. Uh, and to Brian Kemp's point, it, we're not hearing that from Donald Trump. We're not hearing that from uh, Ron DeSantis as much, although I, more so than Donald Trump. You know, again, we saw it today, Donald Trump in court, unable to control himself from outbursts. He's viewing everything that he does as a campaign for himself. He is not out there talking about what he wants to do as president. We have no idea other than retaliate against those who who went up against him uh, and make sure his record is completely wiped clean. That's what we want for the future of our country. That's who we want in the White House as commander in chief. That should be terrifying to, to not only Republicans, Democrats, and independents. So uh, it should hopefully encourage people to go out and vote. All right. Well, Maura Gillespie, Kristen Hahn, sit tight because next we want to talk about those Democrats because 
There's a little situation going on with Democrats up in New Hampshire as well. So we'll get our political panel's thoughts on that next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I'm something of an expert on elusive creatures. So I challenged myself to find President Biden in New Hampshire during this primary season. I thought I was good at hiding. So I asked around, have you seen Joe? I mean, how can you have tens of thousands of people looking for you all the time and not one person find you? But I did keep seeing this guy, this guy, Dean Phillips, who's everywhere. The latest campaign ad from Representative Dean Phillips, who's running against Biden for the Democratic nomination. Joining us now once again is our political panel, Kristen Hahn of Rock Solutions and Maury Gillespie, founder of Bluestack Strategies. So, Kristen, obviously we've talked extensively about New Hampshire through the Republican lens, less so through the Democratic lens, because President Biden instructed the DNC to make the first in the nation primary for Democrats in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Instead, is this going to prove to be a mistake, especially when you have Dean Phillips running against you? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to have really any impact. You've got this write-in campaign that really has no impact because the DNC is not going to recognize any of those delegates, but you still have Democrats in New Hampshire that are getting out there and, you know, waging this campaign that doesn't have much money behind it, but, you know, they're doing it regardless. I don't think it's going to have much of an impact. Also, I think the president, you know, obviously stands behind his decision to diversify the types of voters that are, you know, going first, and that would be South Carolina. But what about the write-in campaign for Biden? We just, okay, no one pay attention, just move on, eyes on the South, and forget what happens in New Hampshire. I mean, really, isn't this the process? I mean, it, but, you know, you can you can decide what that process is. And New Hampshire, I mean, Iowa said we get it, our caucuses, we had problems with them last time around. We're good with South Carolina going first. You know, New Hampshire just was so angry that they wanted to be number one that, you know, they're, they're you know, having this write-in campaign, which is, I think, a little silly. Well, of course, the message, Maura, from Dean Phillips is that there should be an alternative to President Biden, that there should be one allowed, that he shouldn't just be the presumptive Democratic nominee automatically. Is the Democratic Party, in your view, making a mistake by not allowing this to be a competitive process? I don't know if it's a mistake. I, I don't know about that ad that you just played before we came on, but uh, he had other ads. I think that was Bigfoot, right? <laughs> I, was I believe Bigfoot. that was yeah. uh, Bigfoot. Uh, so <laughs> interesting to see him there. But, uh, you know, the ads he'd done before, talk, you know, talking about passing the torch, I think that message is something that Democrats and Republicans alike need to really think about. And I, I applaud Dean Phillips for bringing it up because the Democratic process, and especially in New Hampshire, where you know requirements to run for president or to get on the ballot are uh, more minimal than in other states. So he was able to, I think, also Marianne Williamson is also up on the, um, uh, she's up there as well. So you can vote for her in New Hampshire if you wanted to. Uh, so I think that what the point he was making, though, is that it's time to pass the torch. Again, Trump and Biden, whoever wins, if it is Trump, will be 80 years old in the White House or 80 year old plus. Uh, and so his point was, we need a new generation to come in and, and lead this country uh, who is forward-looking, not back backward-looking. And so I, I think he made a good point there. I think the DNC or the Democratic Party should embrace him. Uh, I know right now they're not feeling that love for him because he is running against Joe Biden for the nomination, and running is probably putting it kindly. But it's something they should look forward to moving beyond this moment uh, and bring him more into the fold. And Kristen, just final thought to you. Obviously, polling shows that the majority of Americans don't want Biden or Trump to be president, but Biden is falling behind Trump in key swing state polls. His approval rating is the lowest of any incumbent president at this time in modern history. It's not trending in his direction, it seems. What does the campaign need to change at this point? I think getting out there, talking about who he is as a person, reminding about who he is as a person. Yes, obviously talking about all of his accomplishments because he's been one of the most successful presidents in, in modern history, but talking about who he is, reminding people about the character of the man because people vote with their hearts. Okay. And on that note, we will leave it. Kristen Hahn of Rock Solutions and Maura Gillespie of Blue Stack Strategies. Thank you both so much for joining me from both New York and Washington this evening as Joe Matthew tries very, very hard to make his way from New York to Washington. The journey back from Iowa has been a really, really long one. And we're about to turn around 
and try to do the same thing in New Hampshire. Crossing my fingers that Joe Matthew is back tomorrow. In the meantime, check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Thank you for joining us on Balance of Power. You'll at least see me tomorrow. Hopefully, Joe too. Safe travels, Joe. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.